Welcome to the services of St. Mark AME Church. Reverend Dr. Joy L. Gallman is our pastor. We invite you to join us as we worship and hear the divinely inspired Word of God. Good morning and welcome to St. Mark African Methodist Episcopal Church and our Sunday morning worship experience. Today is the fourth Sunday um, in Lent and we pray that you are sticking with it, that you're fasting, that you're praying, that you're giving your alms, that you're studying the Word of God. I want to invite you this week to read every day at least some portion of Psalm 22. It will tie into today's worship experience and today's preaching moment. And I believe that if you read a portion of that every day this week, it will be a blessing to your spirit. We also want to invite you to participate either by volunteering or coming by and picking up a box of food. Today is our uh, pop-up pantry and we will be here today beginning at 1 p.m. and it will end at 2.30. If you would like to volunteer, we ask that you show up by noon so that you can help us set up for this experience of blessing um, our neighbors uh, with boxes of food. We want to encourage you, if you don't need food but you know somebody who might need some, we ask that you would come by and pick up a box and be a blessing to the world around us. Today is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Whoa! 
call to worship. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the presence of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. For there thy presence is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the presence of my God than to dwell in the presence of wickedness. Because of the presence of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Those that are planted in the presence of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house, O Lord, I have loved thy habitation, the place where thy honor dwelleth. For the Lord is in his holy temple, let all your peace silence before him. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Together, O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth sing praises.
So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cloth and exchange it someday for a crown. Righteous and eternal God, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for how you've watched over us all this week and allowed us to come into this house at this time to worship and adore your most holy and beautiful name. We give you thanks most of all for that work on that old rugged cross. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. And thank you most of all for rising again for us and giving us a right to that tree of life. Father, before we proceed any further with this service, we want to invoke your presence. For we realize that nothing that we do is possible without you. Our songs are empty, our prayers don't pass the ceiling if you don't touch us. So we ask, oh God, that you look within our hearts and within our spirits. And if you find anything within us that should not be, we ask, oh God, that you take it out and strengthen us. That the, that the world will not see us, but see you. Amen. That you are the way and that you are the answer. Yes. We ask, oh God, that you would bless the musicians, bless the, bless the singers, bless each and every one that's participating in this worship service. We thank you for the technicians that's helping us make this possible. Touch each and every one of them, oh God, you know their needs. Touch them right now. We ask for a special blessing upon the message and the messenger. Yes. Give a ready recollection of the things in which she has studied, that something will be said that will help each and every one of us on our way to eternal life. But not only that, Father, but we ask that the word which is spoken will prick the heart of someone that knows not you in the pardon of their sins, and that they will come while the blood yet runs lukewarm in their veins, crying, what must I do to be saved? Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, we thank you. And we should be ever careful to give your name all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It's in Jesus' name that we ask, and for his sake we do pray. Amen. Amen.
Today's scripture is taken from Mark 15, 1 through 36. It's taken out of the New Revised Standard Version. As soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. They bonded Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered them, he, you say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But, but Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release the prisoner for them anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the, route, so the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was, not, it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowds to have him to release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate stood, spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a, a purple cloth. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began chanting, saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon, a Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Gal. Golgotha, Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The insurrection of the charge against him read the king of the Jews, and with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right, and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking, his, shaking their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests along with the scribes were also mocking him among themselves and saying he saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that me with that we may see and believe those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the morning. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Aloha, Aloha, Lama Sabadin, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard him, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy words. And he said to him, We shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends all the law and the prophets. Oh, <laughs> 
of St. Mark. Here are your announcements for this Sunday morning. St. Mark will have its quarterly conference on Tuesday, March 23rd at 6 p.m. We are asking the leadership of the church as well as the membership to attend the conference and to prepare any reports that are to be shared when the time comes. Also, there will be a Good Friday service for the church on Friday, April 2nd. There will be two showings of the service, one scheduled at noon and another at 7 p.m. Both services will be streaming on Facebook and on the St. Mark AME website, so we hope that you tune in to the service. Thirdly, there will be, uh, St. Mark will host a pop-up food pantry on Sunday, March 14th and on Sunday, March 28th from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. And we are asking for volunteers to come and help with the food pantry if you are able to come. Lastly, since it is the first Sunday in the month of March, we praise God and celebrate all the many birthdays and wedding anniversaries that will take place throughout the month. We thank all of you for your dedication and devotion to the body of Christ, and we wish you many more birthday and anniversary celebrations in the future. So now, these have been your announcements for this Sunday morning. Thank you for your time, and may God continue to bless you all. Bye. 
and pray Stay in his narrow way I've got to keep my life clean every day I want to go with him when he comes back I've come too far and I'll never turn back God is my God is God is God is God is My joy in the morning, the peace in the midnight hour. God is faithful. God is worthy to be praised. God is the sun in the morning and the moon at night. God is peace in the midst of the storm. God is unspeakable joy. God is our all in all. God is the one who loved us enough to send Jesus, Jesus born, Jesus alive, 
Jesus condemned, Jesus crucified, Jesus rejected, Jesus resurrected. God is the God who loves us in spite of all that we are. And so we ask, oh God, that you would manifest yourself in this preaching moment, not for this preacher's vain glory, but manifest yourself in this preaching moment, oh God, so that your sons and your daughters might find peace, acceptance, wholeness, and faith in you by the blood of Jesus Christ. Preach this, your preacher, so that those who are unsaved might be saved, that the unchurched might be churched, that all of us might be empowered, that somebody might be set free and delivered. In the name of Jesus, we pray and ask it all. In the name of the condemned, the crucified, and the rejected Jesus, we ask it all. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and the people of God said, amen. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The condemned, the crucified, the rejected, Jesus cried out in prayer and praise and petition. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Garth Brooks sang Amazing Grace at the Biden inauguration, he didn't sing all the verses. Yet in not singing all the verses, he sang all the verses. In singing the verses that he did sing, he invoked the remaining verses in our collective hearing. Even to, he invoked it so strongly to the extent that some of us kept singing when he finished. Some of us sang the next verse, and some of us, I'm not admitting to anything, but some of us, if I'm fully honest, including myself, when he finished, finished the verses and then stood up in our own living rooms by ourselves and sang, praise God, praise God, praise God. Because we know that amazing grace isn't over until we've praised God. Amazing grace is deeply woven into the collective memory, into the collective memories of Presbyterians and Pentecostals. Amazing grace is deeply woven into the collective memory of politicians and pastors and priests. It's a part of the fabric of insurrectionists and loyalists. Everybody knows the lyrics of Amazing Grace. Amazing grace is a part of the collective fabric for the church and the unchurch. We not only know the words, but when we hear Amazing Grace, it invokes a collective mood and emotion and a response. I would like to offer for your consideration for this preaching moment that Jesus didn't have to sing all the verses of Psalm 22. For those who were gathered at the foot of the cross, they heard the entire psalm. The opening verse um, that Jesus is quoted on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is the opening verse of Psalm 22. And I encourage you throughout this week that you find your way to Psalm 22 and to read it and to pray it throughout this week. Psalm 22 is a prayer for help. It's a psalm of praise. It's a psalm of praise and petition. It's a psalm composed for, it is a psalm that was composed for corporate worship when the people got together to lift up the name of God. When the people gathered together, this psalm was lifted up as a way of them connecting with their God. Psalm 22, um, in the spirit of March, and March being the month of women, a biblical scholar, Eleanor Elaine F. Davis, writes that Psalm 22, the writer of Psalm 22, use extravagant modes of expression and exuberance of the poetic vision that explodes the limits of both the typical form of Israel's traditional understanding of God, of the world, of life, and of death. In short, Psalm 22, the expansiveness, indeed the explosiveness of Psalm 22 makes it unique and made it particularly suitable in 
in recounting the revolutionary story of Jesus' suffering and death. Hmm. Deserted by his followers, condemned by his own religious leaders, rejected by his own people, publicly humiliated, beaten, spat on, and flogged, nailed to a cross, mocked by people who passed by, by Jewish leaders, by two criminals who were being crucified alongside him. He suffered it all in the gospel according to Mark in silence until the very end when at noon darkness came over the whole land and at three he spoke and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those who passed by making fun of Jesus knew the psalm. They knew Psalm 22 and they knew that there was another verse that followed it. Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. The psalmist complains of being forsaken, but you know the interesting thing is, the psalmist still refers to God as my God. There is still a relationship here. It invokes a peace that there is some kind of connection, that they have been intimate together, that they know each other, that this God, regardless of my situation, you are still my God, and it's to you that I go in seeking aid. The prayer of lament found in verse 1 and 2 quickly becomes, gives way to trust. Yet you are holy, enthroned, on the praises of Israel. In our ancestors trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To them, you, they, to you they cried and were saved and you they trusted and were not put to shame. Psalm 22 is an extravagant lament and an extravagant trust. It matches, it's in balance. The extravagance of the lament is matched by the extravagance of the trust, but I am a warm, I'm not human. I'm scorned by others. I'm despised by people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver you. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Psalm 22 balances the lament and the petition and the trust. Yet, the psalm writer almost seems to have two dual personalities battling each other at the same time. Because after lamenting how the people are talking about him, he goes and says, and yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe at my mother's breast. On you I, cast, I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore you, me, you have been my God. There is a balance between lament and trust and petition. Hmm. Verse 11 says, do not be far from me for trouble is near. There is no help. The chief priests, the scribes who were gathered at the foot of the cross, they heard Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But they also would have heard all of the verses of Psalm 22. They would have heard some conviction when Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because they know what verse 12 says. Many bulls encircle me. They open wide their mouths at me like raving and roaring lions. I am poured out like water and my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted at my breast. It seems like Jesus could have written this song. To hear or to read Psalm 22 is to confront with a testimony that comprehends the absence and the action of God in configuration of the affliction unto death and the salvation unto life. To hear and to read Psalm 22 
the psalm writer um, whose prayer and praise is heard undergoes a reversal of relationship before mocked and rejected because of his dependence on God. They pick at him, but after joined into the company who celebrates with him because of his relationship with his God, because of what he is going through. Therefore, he is surrounded by evil forces, those who threaten to replace the present power of God uh, after occasion for the universal, eternal celebration of a sovereign God. What does that mean, Pastor Joy? That after all he's been through, he can still open up his mouth in verse 4, 15 and says, My mouth is dried up like a ship, ship shard. My tongue sticks to the roof of my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircle me. My hands and my feet are shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat at me. They even divide my clothes among themselves. For my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, the reversal, you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. Oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, for my life, for the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. Those who passed by the crucified and mocked him. Those who passed by the condemned, crucified, and rejected Jesus and mocked him. The ones who were gathered around whispering among themselves who heard Jesus say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They also heard the psalm of deliverance from the horns of the wild oxen. You have rescued me. The afflicted, this passage of scripture, this psalm written for collective worship that was a part of the fabric of this community of people who had gathered around the foot of the cross to watch Jesus die. They would have heard the entire psalm and that they would have been reminded that even though affliction is very real, that this psalm reminds them that sometimes the affliction itself becomes the answer. I will tell you of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. You, O offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel, for he did not despise or abhor the afflicted and the affliction. He did not hide his hate face from me, but heard me when I called. God is present with the afflicted. This passage of scripture is reminding those who sang it in the temple and those who are gathered at the foot of the cross that God is a very present help in the time of trouble, that God is present with the afflicted, that God is not hiding God's face from God's people, that God was not hiding God's face from the psalm writer, and God was not hiding God's face from Jesus. Psalm 22, when Jesus quoted the opening verse of this psalm, all those around would have heard and been reminded of verse 25 and 26. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. Many are your hearts. May your hearts live forever. Clinton McLean, the biblical scholar, writes about this part of the song. The afflicted having been assured of God's presence in his or her affliction becomes the source of life for, others, for other sufferers. Life defies death. It is their witness about what God has done and what God is capable of doing in the midst of their affliction. It is their witness and their testimony of how they are handling it and how God shows up that gives life to other sufferers. Sounds like somebody I know. Uh -huh. Psalm 22, when Jesus quotes the first verse of this popular hymn in the life of the world in which he lived. We are reminded those persons would have heard verse 27. 
that all ends of the earth shall remember and return to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship him. Hmm. In that verse, tradition and traditional boundaries are transformed. No. The water was transformed into wine, but what's happening in here? The tradition and boundaries are transcended. The testimony of praise, uh, the testimony of praise, uh, the petition and praise of the afflicted have a universal impact. It begins to include all people. It includes to begin include all space. It includes not only space, but it includes time. And it results in the unbroken communion of God with God's people. Sound like what happened on the cross at Calvary. The scrap, Psalm 22 goes on to say, For dominion belongs to the Lord. For the Lord rules over nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust and shall live for him. Even the dying, the transformation, the transi transition and the transcendence has gone over to even the dying and already dead will worship God. The boundaries have been broken this Psalm 22 and everybody who heard it understood verse 30 and 31 that prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Hmm. Maze, another biblical scholar, says that Jesus, the condemned and the crucified and the rejected, does in his anguish cry to God from the cross what's being recorded in Psalm 22. Jesus joins the company of the afflicted and becomes one with them in their suffering. And he prays. And in praying as they do, he expounds his total identification with the afflicted. Mays goes on to say he gives his followers who are afflicted permission and encouragement to pray for help. He shows that faith includes holding the worst in life up to God. Some of us have been to hell and back in these few short months in 2021, let alone 2020. But I stop by to encourage you that in all the days that are to come, remember, my God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? I, I, I pray that my, when you hear, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That it will invoke in our collective memory the work that Jesus, the condemned, the crucified, the rejected Savior did on the cross. When we hear, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That we remember that Jesus was once condemned, but he was condemned so that we might not have to be condemned. That he came into this world not to condemn us, but that he came into this world so that we might be saved. When we hear, my God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? That we remember that Jesus was not only condemned, but he was crucified. That he stands with the afflicted. He knows what it is to be lied on. He knows what it is to be talked about. He knows what it is to have pain in his body. He knows what it is to be forsaken by his boys. He knows what it is to be left alone and writhing in pain. He knows because he stands within the, in the stands with the afflicted and the affirmed, and he knows and therefore when we think about Jesus and when we hear my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We can too stand boldly before God and call him our God and call on him and invite him, him into our circumstances because in the time of trouble 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the surface, speaks and reminds us and invokes that Jesus had been rejected by God. But when we understand the song and the song that he was quoting, we know that Jesus was rejected, but he was not rejected by his God. He was rejected by his own. He was rejected by the people that he came to see. He was rejected uh, as the gospel according to John reminds us in chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. He came to what was his own and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him and who believe in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. Yes, Jesus was condemned and crucified and rejected, but thanks be to God, because of his rejection, we will not be rejected by God, that we can go before the throne of grace and mercy, that we can ask God to forgive us and save us and become children of God. Ah, oh, Jesus was condemned, crucified, and rejected and called out from the cross oh my God my God why have you forsaken us but we must remember that we don't have to be condemned we don't have to be crucified we don't have to be rejected because of what God did for us in John 3 16 for God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son Jesus so that we might have life and have it more abundantly they may mock you they may talk about you. They may talk about you show as you born. But I stop by to remind you that because of what Jesus did and how he cried out on the cross, the weapon might be formed against you, but it won't work. I stop by to remind you that Jesus, because of his declaration on the cross and the work that he did by hanging there, ah, oh, we don't have to worry about what this world does to us because we can put our trust in a God who made a way out of no way the last time and he'll make a way the next time we can put our trust not in our lament or even in our petition but we can put a trust in the God that we have a relationship that God will take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it around with our good we can stand and know not because of who we are but because my God my God why have you forsaken me that we know that the God will make sure that we have a way of escape we know that God sees us and God knows what you're going through because of the condemned and crucified and rejected Jesus you too can cry out my God my God why have you forsaken me trusting that God will do what God does, that God will raise you up, that God will put your feet on solid ground, that God will make the crooked ways path straight, that God will correct, that God will forgive, that God will redeem, not because we are worthy, but because God will do it because our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And so I pray today, that wherever you are, that you choose this day not to live condemned, not to crucify yourself or allow yourself to be crucified by others. I encourage you today to choose not to continue leading a rejected life but that you will come into relationship with God through the sacrifice of Jesus, realizing that Jesus has done all of that for you, that there is no condemnation in a relationship with God through the blood of Jesus Christ, that with Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you'll never be alone that whatever healing you need it is available through Christ Jesus. 
Maybe you've been rejected all of your life, rejected by family, people you thought were your friends, people who had even vowed and taken a sacred oath to always be there and care for you. Maybe you've been rejected at work, rejected by potential employers. Every application seems just rejected, but there is a place at the altar. There is a place at the foot of the cross where you can be welcomed in, where you can experience the unexplainable love and presence of God in your life. We talked about this in Bible study this Wednesday, that eternal life begins when you walk into the presence of God. And when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God loved you enough to send Jesus, God will come into your space and you can feel God walking with you and talking with you and your eternal life has become, begun. And it is in that space that Jesus came, that Jesus lived, that Jesus taught, that Jesus died, that Jesus was resurrected so that you could be in relationship with God, that you could be in the presence of God so that you don't have to live in hell and die and go to hell, that you don't have to live rejected, you don't have to live condemned, you don't have to live crucifying yourself over and over trying to be good enough, trying to be perfect enough, trying to be worthy of somebody's love. God created you, God loves you. And it is my hope and my prayer that you will allow yourself to trust God enough to open yourself to believe to walk in the presence of your God so that you can claim my God as your God. It doesn't mean every day will be perfect, but it will mean that you will never face a day without God walking with you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we bless God. For those of you who have decided to respond to that pool that you can't quite explain, and to trust God and to confess with your mouth and to believe in your heart that God loved you enough to send his only begotten son so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. For those of you who have decided to give God and Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit a second chance, we celebrate with you. And we encourage all of you um, to find a church home, a church family, a community of faith where you can study together and pray together and fast together and hold each other accountable and to study the word of God together. We would love to be your church home here at St. Mark. I'd love to be your pastor. And so if you're interested in becoming a part of the body of Christ here at St. Mark, we invite you to reach out to us, to email us, to respond um, in the comment sections on Facebook or social media so that we can make contact. But know that even though we do not know your name, we are praying for you. We are praying God's richest blessings upon you and God's peace and restoration in your life. Amen. 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 It is prayer time. Um, and we bless God for Brother Ajabola who will come and who will lead us in a word of prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you for this worship experience and we thank you for this spiritual, or spiritual renewal for the word that we have heard. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy over our lives that allows us to humbly come to your throne of grace with our petitions. Lord, we have seen some people with bereavements in our church family and our, and our communities. We pray, Lord, that you give the families the strength and comfort that they need as they go through the valleys. And our Heavenly Father, we pray that the loving memories of the loved ones that come home to you will be a blessing that will continue to sustain them in these trying times. Lord, we have many of us who need healing. We pray, Lord, our Heavenly Father, that your powerful hands of grace will rest on those who need healing whatever the issue may be. 
And we pray that the physicians and all the healthcare providers, we will guide them for the correct diagnosis and for the correct treatment. And for the family members who are going through with them, we pray, Lord, for peace and strength so they can provide the appropriate support that their family members need as they care for them. In these trying times, our Heavenly Father, we have many people who are going through emotional challenges, including anxiety and even depression, both young and old. And we pray, Lord, that you give them the strength, the, the faith, to know to turn to you. And we pray that you surround them with your angels who can listen to their needs and support them in a way possible so that their spirits will be uplifted. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the COVID-19 vaccines that are now available. We pray for fair and equitable distribution of these vaccines so that no one will be left behind because of some shenanigans. And Lord, we pray that you speak to our hearts to know to take the vaccinations when it is available to us. And to know, Lord, that the best vaccine is the one that gets into our arms, not the one that we think is best that we can get. Our Heavenly Father, we know that some people are going through financial difficulties because of uh, the pandemic and even for other reasons. Our Lord, uh, Jehovah Jireh, we pray, Lord, for your provision for all those people, starting with people around them, that, Lord, you can use as angels to provide their needs, to supply their needs as much as they can. And, Lord, we as a Mark African Methodist Episcopal Church also need your provision for our roof roofing campaign. We pray, Lord, that you speak to our hearts to give freely and generously according to your provision for us and according to our abilities so that when the day comes, we shall once again gather in your sanctuary in a safe building that's worthy of your honor and glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come to you with our petitions. And we know, God, you are greater than any mountain. And whatever the concerns or obstacles may be, that each and every one of us, and those who are watching and listening, and those in our communities may be facing, give us the wisdom, Lord, to know to bring everything to you and that you will use your angels on earth to attend to the needs of your people according to your will. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity again to bring our petitions to you, and we pray that you give us the wisdom and understanding to bring them to you and leave them there and claim the victory because, Lord, you said you would never leave nor forsake us, and that we should ask, and it will be given. So, Lord, we thank you. We will give you all the honor and glory. And we pray all this in the mighty name of us, your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We bless God for your presence in this worship experience. We thank God for all of the worship participants. We thank God for the music ministry. We thank God for the choir and for the produc production team. 
We pray that as we press our way through the seven last sayings of Christ from the cross, um, that you will continue to journey with us. Um, we pray that throughout the week that you would, um, for those of you who have a Lenten box, um, that you have your sackcloth out on the table, that you have the components of your Lenten box laid out to remind you um, throughout the week the power, the power, the power of Psalm 22 and the healing power, the freeing power of the declaration, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The peace and the joy that is available in that. We bless God for each and every one of you and praise God from whom all blessings flow. God of peace, may the God of joy, may the God of hope, may the God who loved you enough to send Jesus to be condemned, to be crucified, to be rejected so that we might have life. May that God rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of you, hence now and forevermore. And the people of God sang. We hope you've enjoyed the programming of St. Mark AME Church. Here, spreading the word of our Lord and Savior is priority, as is living the word. That includes reaching more people with the gospel, serving more people in the community with our pop-up pantry, providing a place where people can feel a sense of belonging, and extending the love of Jesus in ways that include social justice. You can help St. Mark reach more people with your donation. It's easy. Simply give with a click of a button on our website, stmarkame.org, or by going to Givelify. Or you can simply mail your donation to 1616 West Atkinson Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53206. Thank you, and may God richly bless you. 